So in this video, we continue uh, discussing about uh, CASES. This video will be uh, how processors interact with uh, CASES for uh, reads and writes. So let's get started. In the last lecture, we stopped at the notion of average memory access time and uh, what can happen if we have uh, the ideal uh, CAS or CAS hierarchy where the miss rate is zero and uh, we get our data in uh, say one cycle. So if we kind of correlate with uh, the initial slide that we had uh, for out of order processor, uh, if you remember uh, a DRAM uh, access, a costly DRAM access, was kind of blocking all the other instructions because your commit will be in order, right? It should be in the temporal order. So even if other instructions are done, they, they were waiting for the object for DRAM access. Now, if we have the ideal uh, L1 DCAS, then all our uh, loads will be, uh, let's say, done with the access latency of uh, L1D. So in the modern processor, it will be around like four to five cycles. So which means uh, all the memory accesses will be uh, done in the five cycles. So the, if you just uh, do an experiment and try to find out what will be your uh, CPI when you have a perfect CAS hierarchy compared to what we have now, you will see there is a significant uh, gap, right? But of course, it's not practical, but the, this is a good thought process to, uh, you know, think about uh, what else can be done to, to uh, push this uh, performance of uh, CAS hierarchy. So uh, talking about L1 data CAS, uh, as we, we have mentioned, L1 data CAS is closer to processor and it will need high bandwidth and uh, low latency. So that, that's why the hit time should be uh, uh, pretty fast, right? It should be in few cycles, one to four cycles or something like that, right? And that's why we can't uh, have uh, high associative caches, let's say 16 way associative cache, because that will increase the tag comparison time, which will affect your hit time, right? So uh, to improve uh, the effectiveness of uh, private L1 data CAS, uh, which is having low associativity, there's a proposal called victim CAS. Uh, the idea is pretty simple. Since uh, we are using low associativity, our conflict misses will be high, and this is a trade-off between conflict misses and the hit time. Uh, why can't we keep track of the blocks or the lines that get evicted from the L1 DCAS in a small buffer kind of structure, which is called the victim CAS? So the victim cache stores all the evicted lines from, uh, let's say, L1D, right? And in future, if uh, core demands for some data and it actually probes uh, the L1D and the victim cache, so even if it misses in the L1D in, and it gets a hit in the victim cache, then, then we are still... Uh, improving performance because there is no need to go to, let's say, the L2 or L3, right? So uh, this is a pretty small uh, cache of few entries. The initial proposal was for just four to eight entries, and uh, it, it uh, improves performance uh, because you are kind of uh, hiding the uh, latency to the L2 cache, right? So this, this is uh, a pretty uh, simple uh, way of improving uh, our uh, CPI or, or the stalls because of cache misses. So similarly, there are optimizations at the instruction cache level. So remember the data cache contains only the data, the instruction cache contains all the code, right? The binary uh, that, that we run and eventually it will be fetched into the processor, right? So one of the key uh, bottlenecks uh, in the fetch stage of the pipeline that we have already discussed is the notion of branches because we don't have 100% accurate uh, branch predictor, we kind of uh, have to pay the penalty for branch resolution, right? So the, there is a special CAS called uh, trace CAS. What it does, it actually uh, kind of combines all the non-contiguous uh, addresses which are kind of uh, storing the you know, branch outcome into a single cache line. So for example, if this is your block address X, 
this is let's say block address y this is block address z and uh, let's say one of the entries in the block address x is actually uh, jumping to something in the block address y and then from y something to block address z now if you look at from the uh, cache point of view there are actually three different cache lines right but if you follow the instruction order and if, if uh, th this is the order that they are going into uh, then if you pack them into a single cache line your l1 i cache will provide hits to all of them right so this cache is used along with the l1 i cache it's not a replacement for l1 i cache but uh, this is kind of a helper to the l1 uh, i cache so <coughs> If we have looked at uh, the notion of CAS and then uh, the kind of structures that we discussed during our branch predictors and BTV, so they are nothing but uh, CASes, right? So BTV is nothing but a CAS uh, that, that stores the target addresses. The indexing mechanism that we have discussed in the previous lecture that also applies to BTB and other structures like, um, let's say, PST or BST, they are eventually implemented as uh, SRAM arrays, okay? So uh, a high level view on uh, how the core interacts with uh, the cache or the memory. So th this is your processor pipeline that we are uh, naming it as core. And in the fetch stage, we actually demand for the instruction of the code from the L1 instruction cache, right? It's typically known as the front end of the processor uh, uh, where it actually uh, demands for the instruction. And then uh, we move into the pipeline and then finally in the memory stage, we actually demand for the data, right? And that's actually known as the backend. So if you uh, look at it carefully, uh, for data, there is a different structure and for instruction, there is a different structure. It's similar to the concept that we discussed initially, even for a five stage pipeline, we have, you know, different uh, memories, one instruction memory and one data memory. So this is the same uh, concept here. But once you get a miss here at the L1 I cache or a miss in the L1 D cache, you go to L2 or eventually to LLC, uh, which is L3, and those caches are unified. The notion of unified means it stores both instruction and data. Okay. And most of the time you will find that the code footprint is uh, smaller uh, compared to the data footprint. Okay. So the working set of uh, L1i will be, uh, or the code footprint will be uh, more or less fitting into L1i, unless there are uh, high-end uh, server workloads that, that may go to L2 or LLC. Okay, so most of the time you will find that the content of L2 and LLC is dominated by data. Okay, so let's start with uh, the interaction, how a core uh, interacts with the rest of the CAS hierarchy. So Usually the core uh, interacts with, with the memory uh, because of the notion of loads and stores. So load is nothing but um, reading something from the memory, store is something that you want to write into the memory. So uh, this is the uh, processor pipeline and this is the CAS or you can assume the CAS hierarchy and this is the DRAM, right? So on a load, what can happen is you can get a hit and then you get the data in few cycles, uh, pretty simple. But if you get a miss, uh, there are multiple optimizations that you can perform. So one thing is because the DRAM response is kind of slow, you can actually uh, respond with the word or byte that is requested by the processor or the core, and then continue fetching the rest of the block. For example, if this is my 64 byte block, okay, so let's say these are my eight byte chunks or 16 byte chunks, right? So what this particular optimization says is if the processor demands for this particular 16 byte, you first transfer it from the DRAM into the cache and the cache to processor so that the processor won't wait for uh, this data and other instructions which are dependent on this won't wait and the instruction can move in the pipeline. And uh, in the meantime, you can uh, keep on uh, fetching the rest of the block. Okay, so this is known as the critical uh, word first optimization. 
The other way of doing it is you kind of fetch the words or bytes within a cast block in the normal order, right? Just like first byte, second byte, third byte, and like that. And the moment you get the uh, byte that is requested by the core, you send it to the core first instead of waiting for the entire block to uh, come to the cast hierarchy. Okay. So these are the two simple optimizations that kind of uh, uh, help you in, in uh, reducing a bit of uh, miss penalty. So, uh, so, so far we talked about what, what happens on a hit and miss, but if, if you uh, go for a bigger picture, we are talking about an out of order processor, right? And then if we have a super scalar plus out of order processor where you kind of uh, fetch uh, more than uh, four or eight instructions per cycle, then hundreds of cycles of uh, DRAM response will actually stall the out of order processor, right? So in, in that meantime, you'd have uh, fetched, let's say, thousands of instructions, right? So that means one cast miss will actually stall the entire uh, processor, saying I can't handle anything, right? So the solution for this problem is currently the way we are handling misses is the moment I get a miss, the processor waits, right? And it waits till it gets the data, right? Once it gets the data, then the processor moves and you will start getting the new set of uh, requests. What if we allow even parallelism uh, among the misses, right? Because it's an out of order processor, it may happen that there are independent instructions which can move ahead uh, and then get the data from the processor, so from the memory. And uh, why, why to block them uh, just because of one miss, right? So that's the notion of a structure called miss status holding registers, in short, known as MSHRs. So the idea is uh, we keep track of multiple uh, misses between two levels of uh, CAS and memory, right? So it can be between L3, DRAM, L2, L3, L1, and L2. And it, this actually works like a non-blocking CAS. What it means is whenever you get a miss, previously you were blocking the processor saying, okay, I can't handle anything. But now the CAS will say that, no, I, I can still handle your request, uh, keep on uh, sending the request, right? But it will be limited by the number of entries in this uh, MSHR because it will uh, eventually become full. And then once it becomes full, then it will become a blocking cache, right? So the way it works is, let's say we get a, a request to address X that gets a miss. So you put that address into the MSHR and the processor is still uh, running, okay? It's not blocked. So you get another miss, let's say to address Y, okay? You put it uh, again in the MSHR. Remember, this is at the block uh, or the line aligned, which means, any address between x to x plus 63 will be mapped into this particular MSHR entry. Which means if my L1 cache is actually getting missed to let's say x, x plus 16, x plus 32, it won't generate three requests to the L2. Okay. It will actually generate only one request because all of them belong to the same cache line. So the MSHR will actually just send one request. So this will be your MSHR. And it will uh, keep track of uh, only uh, one line because all the other addresses are part of the same line. Okay. So this continues. Uh, let's say eventually we get another miss. So in general, if we have a K entry MSHR, it will allow K outstanding misses. Right. So uh, your, your uh, multiple uh, levels of CAS can actually interact with each other uh, as, as long as the MSR is not full. So this is uh, kind of providing a notion of memory level parallelism. So you have talked about ILP and this is nothing but MLP, right? So uh, the, the order at which uh, the memory uh, or the memory hierarchy is responding uh, because of uh, MSHR uh, is actually uh, the memory level parallelism. Okay. Another thing that you should keep in mind is even though X comes first, then Y and then Z, let's say they get the misses or the castles in the same order and eventually they go to the DRAM, but the DRAM response may not be in the same order. So it may happen that Y may finish faster compared to uh, Z and X 
and uh, it's because of uh, some internal dynamics that we'll discuss uh, later but this can happen so in that case uh, it won't block the msr won't block it will just uh, deallocate this entry okay and then uh, send the data back to the processor right so you, you can assume these msrs are actually at the every uh, cache level so at the l1 you will find some msr or the l2 you will find some msr and like that and uh, the goal is to make sure that they, they provide the necessary mlp at uh, different uh, in, interaction levels l1 to l2 l2 to l3 and uh, l3 to dram okay so uh, sorry so uh, we talked about the notion of uh, loads or, or uh, the reads but but what happens on a write so when you want to write which is nothing but a store you can actually uh, do some additional stuff just, just to uh, differentiate whether it's a write or, uh, or whether whether you have updated something into the existing cache block or not and that is done through the additional bit called dirty bit so we talked about the notion of valid bit in the previous week's lecture and uh, we also talked about replacement priority bits so now you have to put a dirty bit whenever you update a cache block so that uh, the cache uh, controller or the rest of the hierarchy knows that okay this particular block is updated after it uh, brought into the cache okay and then 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 there are two ways you can actually interact with the rest of the hierarchy on a write one is called the write through cache and another is the write back cache so in the write through cache the moment you get a hit uh, let's say you get a hit in the l1 for a store request you actually kind of propagate it to pro propagate the writes to the next level of hierarchy that means eventually you will uh, send the store to l2 llc and to dra okay so this is like right through cas the problem with uh, this approach is you need an acknowledgement at the end and then only uh, the l1 cache will be sure that yeah uh, the right uh, is actually uh, the, the updated value is actually there in the dra right because in the right you are updating a particular address with with a new data right and uh, the second uh, downside will be you need additional bandwidth on every write you have to update the rest of the hierarchy right uh, in contrast to that we have something called a write back cache which is commercially used and here whenever you write something into a cache block at a particular level you don't write it to the next level so this is called write back okay and you just update the next level in the cache hierarchy only on a replacement so when the block is kicked out from let's say l1 then you update to l2 when the block is kicked out from l2 then only you will update into llc okay i'm not talking about all the blocks it's only the writes because eventually the writes should be updated in the dram right uh, because we are we are actually uh, storing the data of dram in cache to hide the memory latency but the dram should have the updated copy okay so this is how it works so let's say uh, we are trying to write something into the address z and this is the corresponding data uh, in the write back cache what will happen is on a replacement you put this data in a buffer called write back buffer okay again you need it because the rate at which you send the writes from the cache to the next level uh, is different from the way it get consumed at the dram right so there's a bandwidth mismatch and whenever you uh, have a bandwidth mismatch you need a buffer okay so uh, this block is actually uh, put in the write back buffer on a replacement so whenever you get a, a miss and you replace a block you check whether the dirty bit is set if the dirty bit is set then you put the block in the data uh, in the write back buffer okay so in in general if you look at uh, stores or the writes are not critical for performance okay you can actually think about why uh in in the context of uh, modern processors because uh, as long as uh you have updated your value in one of the caches let's say uh address x is updated with value 100 okay and that value 100 is let's say already present in cache then the cache controller responds to the processor saying yeah your write is done okay 
and after that you keep on uh, sending to the next level or next level and finally to DRAM eventually it will go to DRAM but from the processor point of view, it's done so it's not critical uh, in terms of your your final uh, CPI calculation okay so we talked about what happens on the right hit whether we go for uh, right through or uh, right back uh, but things can happen uh, differently when you get a right miss so usually uh, on a right miss when you want to write something into uh, let's say address z and that address z is not present in the cache you get a miss what the cache controller do it will convert the store into a load and this load will go to the mshr okay remember this is different from the write back write back comes into picture when a block is replaced when it is kicked out you put it in the write back buffer if it is dirty okay but here we are talking about a store request which is missing in the cache and you are converting into a load and finally the load goes to dram the dram responds okay once it responds you, you kind of write it in the cache okay because now you got the address so this is known as uh, write allocate policy on a miss because on a miss we are allocating the block into the cache and writing into the cache and this is usually used because uh, write back caches are more common so if you bring the block into the cache and write it only in the cache then eventually when the block get replaced it will be written back into the DRAM so the write allocate and write back is uh, a combination that is usually used in the commercial machines. Finally, there is another optimization again for writes, uh, and then uh, it's called the write merging. It is similar to the notion of MSHR that I discussed. If you are getting a read for uh, different parts of the same cache line, then you kind of uh, have only one entry, right? So similarly, in the write merging case, instead of you know up updating our writes to DRAM on every write, you can you kind of merge all the updates that are coming to a particular cache line, right? Let's say you have updated uh, address Z, address Z plus one, address Z plus sixteen, and something like that with value 10, uh, 20, 30, and whatever. So in instead of sending requests each and every time you update, you kind of merge everything and finally you get a uh, cache line aligned uh, 64 byte uh, data that you can update at the memory okay so the, these are the some of the optimizations for uh, improving our read and write performance so if we look at uh, the bigger picture in terms of uh, cpi we have already talked about the average memory access time but the average memory access time is actually contribute uh, or the contributors of average memory access time are the nothing but the read stalls and the write stalls right so it depends how many reads or writes are happening uh, in your program what are the typical read or write miss rate and then what are the corresponding read and write miss penalty right so if you are uh, uh, looking at these numbers you will find that the right uh, number of writes and write miss rate and miss penalty will be relatively uh, lower compared to uh, the reads okay so eventually all these numbers will uh, they, they will contribute into your average memory access time so if you want to go deep into a, what, what actually contributes to my average memory access time you can actually find out read stalls at uh, every level of cache right l1 l2 l3 dram similarly uh, for the write stalls at l1 l2 l3 and dram okay with that i will stop thank you